as a parent, sometimes, sometimes it seems like every day is, is just a battle. I don't know if you've ever felt this way. But parents are constantly faced with the difficult task of dealing with opposition, hostility, and a continual barrage of assaults from our kids. And so in light of the conflict that we feel often, it's important for every parent to be armed and ready to respond at a moment's notice. In my household, uh, for example, my wife and I, we've got an arsenal of weapons just stockpiled, ready to be used whenever necessary in order to mount a counterattack against our kids. Would you like to hear about them? These are verbal weapons, just so you know. You want to hear, you want to hear some? Okay. Some you're probably really familiar with. So, if my kids say the words, why do I have to do that? We respond immediately and say, because I said so. Some of you maybe use that as well. That's a good one. That's direct, to the point, strong, hard to argue against that. Here's another common one. If my kids say, I don't want to do that, we usually respond by saying, I'm not asking you to do it. I'm telling you to do it. You guys familiar with that one too? Anybody use that in the room? That's a good one also. Great response. Very common. Here's a couple more that are slightly less common that we are ready to use at a moment's notice. So if my kids say, I don't like that, right away my wife and I, we know to respond by saying, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. That's a good, it rhymes, it's a pretty good one. Okay, here's one more. This is one I use. My, I don't think I've heard my wife use this. I use this a lot uh, and it's my favorite. It's my favorite response. When my kids say, that's not fair, I always respond by saying, fair is where you get cotton candy. This is life. <laughs> I didn't invent that. I, I'm not taking credit for that one. I've heard that somewhere, but it's a good one. And my kids hate that. I love it, but my kids hate it. Because when they say that's not fair, what are they looking for? They're looking for sympathy. They're looking for me to change the way I'm treating them and to maybe give them some justice. And so this is what they're hoping for. And in those moments, I love to respond that way because I don't want to give them sympathy, right? Because that's just going to perpetuate them constantly saying that that's not fair. What I want to tell them and to teach them is something very important, and it's this lesson. Life isn't fair. Life isn't fair. For those of us who, who've lived past childhood, we're well aware of the fact that life just it isn't fair sometimes, just, just, just the way it is. That's how it goes. And as much as we as parents try to make things even and fair, and we try to treat our kids kind of the same way as much as we can, uh, the truth is they need to learn sooner than later that just life isn't fair sometimes. And so we want to instill that in our kids. That's just how it goes. That's the way God designed it. In fact, I want to suggest to you this morning something that perhaps is a little bit controversial as I say it, but I'm going to say it anyways. God isn't fair. He isn't. I'm not saying that God isn't just. He is just, completely just. But that's a different word. What I'm telling you is God isn't fair. Now, that might sound strange. It might sound like a bad thing when I say, well, man, Pastor Joe, you're saying God's not fair. But it's true. And the truth is, it's a blessing because if God was fair, if God did give us what we truly deserve, hear me this morning, you and I would be in a whole heap of trouble. If God was fair with us and gave us what we deserve, we'd be in trouble right now. You see, the truth is we should be thankful that God isn't fair. We should be thankful that he treats us, his people, in a different way. And Lord willing, this morning, as we open up the pages of Scripture, we're going to see this together. And So I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 41 this morning. Genesis 41. And as you're turning in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 41, just want to remind you, for those of you who haven't been around, we've been working our way through a series on the life of Joseph, and we're kind of in the home stretch. So this week uh, and then next Sunday are the last two messages in our series. And so if you haven't been with us, that's okay. We're going to do a little recap of some things. But uh, we're, we're in the home stretch. We're almost done. And uh, so far in our series, just for those of you who haven't been around, just so you know, Joseph was a dreamer. 
And uh, he was destined for greatness, but unfortunately, because he was kind of braggadocious about that, his brothers didn't like him, they despised him, in fact, they wanted to kill him, but instead, they chose to throw him in a pit and sell him into slavery in Egypt. And after arriving in Egypt as a slave, Joseph's life seemingly got better for a moment, but then it went from bad to worse because his master's wife saw him, was attracted to him, and she tried to convince him to to lie with her, and he refused her, and so she lied against him and, and said that he tried to rape her, and Joseph was thrown in prison, and there in prison he was forgotten about. And then last Sunday we talked about the fact that after spending more than a decade in prison, Joseph learned some humility. In fact, he learned the secret of humility, and he was humbled. And uh, he was finally given a big opportunity. And so what happened was, after an incredible turn of events, uh, God orchestrated in such a way where Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he was having dreams, and he was reminded of the fact that there was somebody in prison who could interpret dreams. And so he met with Joseph, and Joseph said, it's not me who can interpret dreams. God is the one who will give Pharaoh an interpretation. So Pharaoh shared his dreams, and Joseph said, your dreams mean that there are going to be seven years of plenty in the land of Egypt, followed by seven years of famine all around. And Joseph said to Pharaoh, you need to, uh, to bring some people in who can govern the land in such a way where you stockpile all your grain during the good years, the seven good years, so that way during the seven years of famine you have enough food and you can even provide it for people all around that region and make a lot of money. And so this is how it happened last week that we ended up where Joseph was elevated to a position of power because Pharaoh said, Joseph, you're the guy. I want you in charge. And so Joseph was elevated to a point where he was now in a prominent position, and that's where it ended last week. And now we're picking up at the end of chapter 41. And as we pick up in chapter 41, I just want to give you a heads up. Throughout the series so far, we basically went from chapter to chapter to chapter and kind of moved through it in in chunks like that at a time. Uh, If you know the story of Joseph, you know that it ends at the end of the book of Genesis, which is chapter 50. I'm talking about chapter 41. Which, if you do the math there, there's a lot of chapters in between. And so we're going to gain a little ground this morning. What we're going to do is we're going to just glean from five different chapters the story so that way we can kind of land on one central theme today. So we're going to move a little quick this morning. Just got to give you a heads up. Hopefully your hands are warm. Uh, You came in and you've been able to get some coffee and stuff because you're going to be flipping your pages of your Bible just a little bit this morning. And so... Uh, As we close out chapter 41, that's where we're going to jump in in the beginning. I want to draw your attention first to the first section. Number one, Joseph's advancement. Joseph's advancement. You see, as this chapter concludes, we discover that after Joseph is given this prominent position in the land of Egypt, he ends up getting married, and then he starts governing the people, and things start going really well. And notice what it says, picking up in verse 50 of chapter 41. It says, before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me get all my hardship. Uh, Sorry, for God has uh, made me forget all my hardship and my father's house, and all my father's house. The name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end, and at the end of seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, what he says to you, do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in all the land of Egypt. Moreover, in all the earth, moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. Okay, notice here how as we read the end of that chapter 41, things in Joseph's life, they begin to finally turn a corner. Things start to get better. He advances himself now. He's in a position of power, and he's doing so well that virtually he's forgotten about all his past troubles and hardships. He's turned the corner. Things are going great for him now. It says that he forgot about everything that happened in his household. Uh, That's all a thing of the past. Now he's experiencing blessing and fruitfulness. In fact, that's why he names his sons Manasseh and Ephraim, because they, they mean Uh, to forget, and fruitful, twice as fruitful. That's what the names mean. How would you like to name your kids? Fruity and forgetful. Those are not the best names. But if you like unique names, you can take that. I'm sure it's up for grabs, and probably nobody in the church has that. 
that I know of. So Joseph has children, and his children, their names mean that things are going great, and so he's moving forward. His life is great now, and we read uh, that this chapter ends by saying the entire world, it came to Egypt to, to come to Joseph to buy grain. It's incredible. Uh, in this ancient world, people all around, they're coming to Egypt because they're starving. It's a famine, and they need grain, and they're all coming to Joseph. And it's an amazing detail, but I think specifically the reason this detail is mentioned is because it's going to lead and foreshadow what's going to happen in the next chapter. Some very specific people are going to come to Egypt uh, in search of grain. Can you guess who they are? His brothers. Oof, it's about to get real awkward in here. His brothers are going to show up, and that leads to our second section. Number two, his brother's arrival. His brother's arrival. Notice what it says now in chapter 42. We're going to begin from verse 1. It says, When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, Jacob is Joseph's father and the brother's father, he said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. So that's how severe it is. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? He said. They said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. They said to him, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We're all sons of one man. We're honest men. Yeah, right. And your servants have never been spies. And he said to them, No, it is the nakedness of the land that you've come to see. And they said, We, are your, we your servants, are twelve brothers, and the son of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father. And notice this. And one is no more. And so as we read that second section, Notice how after Joseph's brothers, they show up. They don't recognize who he is. He knows who they are. They don't recognize who he is, and immediately they bow down to him. Remember the dreams? Chapter 37, Joseph dreams these dreams that one day his brothers are going to bow down before him. That's why they want to kill him, and lo and behold, it comes true. His brothers, they see him, they bow down, and the moment they arrive in Egypt, all of a sudden, these former memories, right, the, the memories that in the previous chapter said that they were gone. He had forgotten about them. That's why he named his child Forgetful. He forgot about them, and so now these memories are finally flooding back into his mind and heart, and all these things he had forgotten, they're coming back to him, and he's clearly upset, as you'd expect, and so he begins to treat his brothers harshly. He accuses them of being spies, and notice their response. They say this, we're not spies, we, your servants... Our twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan, and behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and notice this, and one is no more. Notice how they refer to Joseph as if he's dead. We don't know why exactly they say this. In fact, to say that one is no more, that's a little ambiguous. But it seems as if they're saying he's gone, he's done for, he's dead. In fact, if you continue to read through the next couple chapters, you'll notice again and again, even when their father is nowhere part of the story, they refer to Joseph as if he's dead. This is the narrative that they've now played out in their mind. This is the truth they've accepted. I think in their mind, whether or not he's actually really alive is kind of irrelevant because now he's gone. He's a slave in the land of Egypt somewhere. His life is over. And so for them, he's as good as dead. This is what they believe. He's gone, no more, out of the picture, forever. Or so they thought. Little did they know he's standing right in front of them. And so after they try to convince him of their true identity, that they're not spies, uh, the chapter continues. We're not going to read that. We don't have time for that. But Joseph, he begins to have these emotions. Uh, he, he feels a connection uh, to part of his family. Particularly, he wants to see his brother Benjamin. Now, I want to remind you again about this family tree and this, this dynamic is really interesting. So Joseph has 12 brothers, but they have four moms. 
Kind of sounds familiar to me. Anybody see this show? I've, I've never seen it. I've heard about it. But this is kind of the scenario. This is his house, right? One dad, four moms. Now, in a scenario like this, again, there's drama and stuff like that. This is why there's a show on TLC like this. But in this scenario, if you think about it practically, all these other moms, not Joseph's mom, uh, they have children, and that would make them, these brothers, his half-brothers. But see, Joseph's mother, who is Rachel, she had two kids. The first one she had was Joseph, and then she ended up dying in childbirth while having the youngest child, Benjamin. So Benjamin would be Joseph's full brother. So he has a very special connection with his full brother, Benjamin. And, uh, and he's the youngest son. And, and, and remember, it says there that Benjamin wasn't allowed to come on the trip. And so in an effort to see them, and this is kind of the unique layout of all those brothers, but in an effort to see his brother, his brother Benjamin, who he misses now and who, who he longs to see, Joseph has a sneaky little plan. What he says is, okay, Simeon, come here. He takes one of his brothers, Simeon. He ties him up. He binds Simeon. And then he says to the nine brothers who are standing before him still, he says, go back to the land of Canaan, where you're you're from. And if you want to see your brother Simeon again, you need to return. But this time you need to bring your youngest brother, Benjamin. So I know you're telling the truth. Go back and bring back Benjamin to us. And so the brothers go home and that's what they end up doing. In chapter 43, Jacob, the father, he reluctantly sends his now last and remaining beloved son, Benjamin, with his brothers to the land of Egypt so that way they can get more food and more grain and they can also bring back their brother Simeon. And so wisely, Jacob sends with these boys all these extra gifts and all these extra presents to give to Joseph so that way, uh, hopefully, he shows them favor. And so when they get there to Egypt, they arrive and it seems that Joseph is now putting together this banquet. So they go to this banquet and at this banquet, for the first time, we really begin to see section three, Joseph's affection. This is really the point in the story where now you begin to see that Joseph isn't just angry. He has affection for his family. Notice what it says, beginning with verse 26. When Joseph came home, they brought him into the house, or sorry, they brought into the house to him the present that they had with them and bowed down to him to the ground. And he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And they bowed down their heads and prostrated themselves. Notice how the, the text just keeps repeating that. Right? That's the fulfillment of the dream. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there, and he washed his face and came out, and controlling himself, he said, Serve the food. Now, can you feel the emotion in this story as this is now unfolding? He's now spent two decades away from his family. He's thought he's forgotten about that, that that's a thing of the past. And now when they see each other and he sees his beloved brother, Benjamin, after all those years, he begins to weep and pour out this emotion and affection. And those family connections, those feelings, they don't fade. They don't just go away. My grandmother still alive. She's in her 80s now. When she was eight years old, uh, her dad was actually a pastor in Saginaw. And when she was eight years old, their family moved to Bolivia because my great-grandfather wanted to be a missionary and to tell people who were in the jungle who had never had outside contact with the world around them, he wanted to tell them about Jesus. So they went to Bolivia in the 1940s. And while they were in Bolivia, my grandfather and four other guys, they got... um, this group together and they went into the jungle to kind of blaze a trail in the jungle to tell people about Jesus. And when they made contact with the tribe, uh, finally they they sent reports back and said, hey, we we found a trail, we're making contact. And so they entered into the woods one more time, into the jungle one more time, and then my grandmother didn't hear about them anymore. Eight years go by. So she's eight when they go to Bolivia. Eight years pass and she doesn't know what happened to her father. So now she came back to the U.S., she's 16 years old, and she finally heard the news that my great-grandfather, when they went into the jungle, they met this tribe of people, and they started to make a good contact, and things started out well, and then something changed, and they ended up murdering the five men in the jungle, and people didn't know what happened for, for eight years. And so imagine being my grandmother, eight years old, from eight to 16. 
your childhood is marked by the fact that you don't know where your dad is, and then when you're 16, you find out he was murdered the whole time. He was gone. Imagine how intense that is. And so today, I'll talk with my grandmother, and I'll ask questions. I'll, I'll say, you know, ask her about stories about my great-grandfather. And as soon as I ask her, she begins referring to him as daddy, even though she's in her 80s. This happened in the 1940s. She refers to him as daddy, and then within four or five words in, she begins to weep every time, hands down, every time. All those years, all those years ago, and yet family feelings, they don't fade. The emotion is raw and still real within her heart, and, and she weeps when she thinks of her father who died. And here in this story, it's been 20 years, he hasn't seen his family, but when he sees his brother who he loves, he begins to weep. And as the chapter ends, we see that Joseph's brothers, they still don't know uh, who he is. They're unaware of his identity. And even though Joseph now has the right to kill his brothers, or at the very best, right, maybe he could even do what they did to him. He could sell them into slavery, or he could throw them into a prison. He, he has the ability to do that. Joseph doesn't retaliate. In fact, the chapter closes with Joseph's brothers feasting. Or they're at a party. They're feasting. They're enjoying all this amazing food in the land of Egypt. They're drinking and having a wonderful time, the text says. And all the while, they're completely oblivious to the fact that Joseph, their brother, is standing right before them. And so we move into the next chapter, and Joseph brothers, once, once that meeting is done, they feel like things went pretty well, so they prepare to go back home. And so they get their caravan and, and uh, their supplies ready, and they get to go back home. And, and when they're preparing for this, Joseph, he abundantly provides for them. He gives them uh, enough food. It's, it's all they can carry. So as much as they can carry, he provides food for them. He gives them money. He gives them all sorts of supplies for their trip back. So they're thinking everything's great. Little do they know that Joseph is still a little bit sneaky. And so he takes his silver cup and he places his silver cup in his brother Benjamin's bag and he sends them on their way. And just when they get outside of the city, Joseph sends his men to go intercept the caravan. And when they stop them, the men accuse Joseph's brothers of being thieves, uh, of stealing some from, from the royal household. And, and they begin to deny it naturally. They say, we didn't do anything. We didn't take anything. Check our bags. And so when they begin to check the bags, what happens? Well, as we see, the cup is in Benjamin's sack. And immediately after finding this silver cup, what do you think the brothers do? They start freaking out. Which brings us to section four. The brother's anxiety. His brother's anxiety. This discovery immediately sends Joseph's brothers into a panic. They're thinking now, this is it. This is the point. We're in trouble. Notice what it says in the text. We're in chapter 44. We're going to pick up in verse 13. We're just going to read two verses. Beginning in verse 13, it says, Then they tore their clothes, and every man loaded his donkey, and they returned to the city. And when Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell before him to the ground. Notice what's happening here. They're freaking out. This is it. The, the time has finally come. After all the terrible things they did to their brother, they thought they could get away with it. And now here, they discover what's going on because God is repaying them for all the terrible things they've done. This is the moment of reckoning. Joseph now has his chance to repay them, to get even, to get back at his brothers. I mean, let's be honest. This is what they deserved, isn't it? Isn't this what Joseph's brothers deserved? If life was fair, the moment they came back, Joseph would just simply say, okay, let's go, guys. You're now slaves in a foreign country, and then when you get there, you might end up in prison. That's what happened to me. You did it to me. My turn to do it to you. Wouldn't that be fair? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's what we would expect to be fair, right? But see, that's not what happens in our story. It's not what happens in our story. It doesn't end up that way because the truth is, life isn't fair. Life isn't fair. Fair is where you get cotton candy. This is life. And life's not fair. And so as we move into chapter 45, even though he has every right to punish his brothers, even though now he has the means to do it because he's in a position of control and power, he can certainly punish his brothers and make them pay for what they've done. That's not what we see. In fact, we see the exact opposite. What we see now in this last section, section 5, is Joseph's amnesty. He pardons them. Notice how he pardons his brothers in chapter 45. I'm going to pick up in verse 1. We're just going to read this last section through verse 11. It says, Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. 
He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to keep it alive for you, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not... You who sent me here, he said, but God, he has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord over all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you For there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. Do you notice what happened here? It's incredible. Joseph doesn't give his brothers what they truly deserve, does he? Instead, he offers them something else. He gives them grace. Joseph shows them grace. Now the word grace means unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor. That's what grace is. It's not something you can work for. It's not something that's owed to you. It's only something that you receive freely as a gift. Because if you earn it, it's no longer grace, right? That, that it, it's something that you've earned. Grace is freely given. It's unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor. And so in our story, Joseph chooses not to do the fair thing. No, he chooses to do the gracious thing. Think about it for a moment. Joseph's brothers deserve death, but he offered them deliverance. Joseph's brothers deserved famine, but he allowed for feasting. Joseph's brothers deserved to see his fury, but instead he showed them his forgiveness. Joseph's brothers deserved retribution, but he proposed reconciliation. And Joseph's brothers deserved to be itinerant, but he wanted them to have an inheritance, an abundant future, and a home with him forever. This isn't what's fair. That's not fair. That's not what they deserved. It isn't fair, but see, fair is where you get cotton candy. This is Grace. This is grace. And beloved, I want you to know that if you struggle sometimes in life, like me, with this idea that things are happening to you that just aren't fair, maybe you've worked really hard in your workplace and you've deserved the promotion and again and again and again you see people around you getting that spot or getting that credit when really you're the one who deserves to be put in that position and you think it's not fair, when you experience some sort of challenge or trial in your life and you've tried to serve the Lord and be a good person and do your best, but now you're suffering with some affliction or someone you love or care about is, is dying or suffering with something, or maybe when you've been a good spouse and that spouse that you're married to has cheated on you and now you're in a situation where you're struggling because it's just not fair, you've tried to live the right way, maybe for you, in your life you struggle with the fairness of God. And you think to yourself, how can I live in a world where things are just so messed up like this and it angers you and frustrates you and makes you upset? If that's you this morning, I want to challenge you to think from a little different perspective. Because you see, the story of Joseph and his brothers, this is not isolated and it's not independent from us. Hear me. This is our story. This is our story. Think about it for a moment. In this story, the beloved son who left his father comes back from the dead in order to save, forgive, bless, and provide a new home for his brothers. Who is this story really about? Jesus. 
This is the story of Jesus, and this is the story of us. And so often with these biblical characters, we love to put ourselves in the hero role. Oh, just as Joseph persevered, I'm like Joseph, and so I'm going to persevere. We like to put ourselves in those roles. Unfortunately, beloved, just hear me, you and I are usually in the other roles. We're the bad guy. We're the brothers. We're the ones who've messed up. We're the ones who deserve to be punished, right? The truth is we were enemies of God. We crucified our brother Jesus. And in response to that, he didn't give us what we deserve. He didn't. Instead, he shows us grace. This is what our brother Jesus shows us. Grace. Unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor. He shows us grace. This is why the scriptures tell us that the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. This is what Psalm 103 tells us. It's all about God's grace that he lavishes upon us. You see, the truth is, fair is where you get cotton candy. This is grace. And so as I begin to wrap up this message this morning, I just want to challenge your thinking, beloved. I want to challenge my own thinking. I want to challenge your perspective on life because the truth is, life isn't fair. You will go through hardships and so will I and there will be things that will happen and we'll struggle because it won't be fair. But I want you to know that's okay. In fact, that's a good thing. It's a good thing that life isn't fair because if it was then you and I would be dead in our sins and transgressions. We'd be lost and hopeless, and we'd have to face the wrath of God on our own and be judged according to all the things that we've done. But see, praise God. The gospel means that we don't need to face our own judgment. Jesus was judged for us in our place. This is grace. This is what God does to us. So praise God that he isn't fair. Praise him that he isn't fair because instead he chooses to be gracious. That's our big idea this morning. As we close out this message, this is the big idea. Thankfully, beloved, God isn't fair. He's gracious. If you are part of the body of Christ, he does not treat you fairly. He treats you graciously. He loves you. Despite what you've done, he loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die in your place. And through faith in Jesus Christ, he lavishly and graciously pours out upon you forgiveness, eternal life, hope, a future, a home with him forever, a place where you're going to celebrate with him, you're going to feast with him at the wedding supper of the Lamb. This is what he offers you. It's grace. He's not going to give you what's fair. Fair is where you get cotton candy. He gives you grace. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to thank you for the good news of the gospel this morning. Lord, if we were focused on what was fair all the time, then, Father, we would be in trouble. But when the fullness of time came, you sent forth your Son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. Father, you sent your son, Jesus. You freely gave him. You did not withhold him from us, but Father, you sent him to earth where he suffered and bled and died the death that we deserved in our place so that through his work on the cross, we might be pardoned from our sin and through his resurrection, we might be given new life in him. I thank you, Lord, that you're not fair not fair to me. You're gracious to me. I thank you for the reminder of that this morning as we look at the story of Joseph. I thank you for the reminder of the fact that, man, sometimes we cry out for things that we truly don't want because we don't really understand what we're asking for. Lord, we don't need what's fair. That would be a hopeless existence. We need what's gracious, and you provide it. Thank you, Lord, for this amazing hope. 
Thank you that fair is where you go for cotton candy, but you give grace. I just thank you for that, Lord. I thank you in this room for anybody here today who needs to hear this, maybe the person in the room who's been trying to live and earn and work and labor for some sort of reward or favor from you, Lord, I pray that this morning they would just realize for perhaps the first time that you would open their heart and open their eyes to see the truth, the light of the knowledge of the glory of Christ. They'd hear the gospel and respond this morning by not working and exerting effort and religion to reach you, but Father, that they would just rest in you and receive your grace that you offer through Christ and through faith in him. We ask and pray that you would change lives in the room this morning for your glory and for our good. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray all these things.